Hey, I'm Josh. I thought I'd try making a video where I haven't... Uh, where I haven't scripted every single word that I want to say beforehand. Let's go! First up, I want to show you this light switch that I made. If I grab onto it and then flick it, you can see it turns on this pretty light down here. Let's see that again. When you switch it off, it fades out a little bit, and then when you flick it back on, click. Nice. I spent a bit of time on this shader to make the lights glow when they get brighter. So if I slowly turn up the intensity value on this fluoro light here, you'll see that the room gets brighter, but then after a certain point, a glow starts to appear around the light bulb. And you can see I've intentionally made the light shape have these like beams that go out either side of the fluoro light. And as it gets brighter and brighter, it will just become whiter and whiter until you just can't really see anything. I think it actually looks super awesome. And so basically when you turn on the light, it just gets the value and then goes bing, 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 until it's shining at its intended intensity. And then when you turn it off, it goes to like 20% and then lowers down to zero. All I need to do now is add sound effects to it. Bing, 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 bing. You may have noticed already that I have a camera system. So when I walk down the staircase, you see that the camera is centering on the player. And if the player moves really fast, then they go slightly off center and then the camera sort of snaps back onto them when they stop. When I step off the bottom of the staircase, you'll see that the camera slowly zooms out so that it covers the whole room. And that's so that when you flick the light switch, you can actually see what light it turned on. Because if it was still zoomed in, you wouldn't be able to see that. You can see that the camera isn't just fixed in place. It sort of does this interpolation between multiple different camera snapping zones. It's called camera trigger. So down in the basement here, I have a camera trigger that tells it to zoom to a specific level. As I walk into this other camera trigger in the corner here, you'll see it will stop following the player and then slowly transition. The amount that it actually follows the player as I move further away from the trigger zone increases slowly, just to give it a bit more of a smooth feel. I have this thing called wall mesh, which I made a few devlogs ago where you can insert a bunch of points and it will automatically figure out how to do all the junctions and how to display the images on the walls. And it will automatically create a mesh that has these fancy junctions in it. Now what it couldn't do before is have one texture on one side and then a completely different texture on the other side. It allows me to do fancy things where the bathroom has tiled walls and then everywhere else has wood walls, even on two sides of the same wall. So over here in the inspector, you can see the different types of walls that I can select. One side of the wall is A and the other side is B. I really need to add a visualization that tells me which side is A and which side is B, because currently I have to just like click it and guess. But you can see I can set both to wood or both to tiles, or I can select tiles just for A and then wood for B. Or in this case, I really want it to be the other way around because now the tiles are outside the bathroom. So I want A wood, B tiles. This wall mesh keeps proving itself by being useful for more than just walls. For example, I've added this roof trim here where it sort of shows you that there are roof tiles around the edge of the house. It's not final yet, but I think it looks pretty good so far. And so basically that's just a wall and I can edit it like any other wall. So I can add points in the middle. <laughs> this texture isn't really designed to work with junctions like this. This roof tile thing actually caused problems with my wall mesh design. I couldn't actually decide which way the texture would be applied. You can see here it's pointing inwards towards the wall on the edge of the house the whole way around. I want it to be pointing outwards. So I added this feature where I can check this box here, mark roots. And now I can click on any nodes where I want the texture to begin. So if I click on this one, you can see it's now propagated the texture the other way. Before it started over here and then went down that way, but now it starts over here and goes that way, thereby applying the texture the right way up. I've been spending a bunch of time on this rope system. So here I have a hook with a rope and a reel. 
The basic idea is that you can drag the hook and it will automatically wrap itself around the corners of the walls. This is something that's basically impossible to do with an actual physics engine because there'd be so many glitches and things would just clip through the corners of the walls. So what I've done instead of using the physics system is I have a thing called the reel and then I have a whole bunch of these corners that have a component on them called rope reel marker. Basically each corner has a certain radius and the rope will detect when it passes through any corner and it will wrap itself around that corner and automatically unwrap it. So in the area where this rope can actually reach, I basically have to go through and add these corner markers. These markers actually have a radius. So for example, I've made this giant marker here and you'll see if I drag the hook, it will get wrapped around that circle. This was basically an exercise in trigonometry where I had to find the tangent between the hook and this last circle here and between that circle and that circle and that circle and that circle and that circle. Eventually it will have a maximum length and when the rope reaches that length the hook will stop in its place and then it won't be able to go any further. I'm pretty happy with this system because the hook will always catch on a corner no matter how fast it's actually going. Right? So if I go really fast past this corner, it will never clip through the corner. It will always catch on to it. Next up, I made a whole bunch of improvements to the character rig. You can see that his model is actually 3D, but in the game, it's basically just a bunch of 2D images stacked on top of each other. As you can see here, if I grab all the parts and move them around, it looks pretty weird. Alright. Each of those parts have specific requirements, and I have to render them all separately. So I had to make a bunch of changes to allow me to use the images more flexibly in the game. You can also see that I added this super awesome mouth. It was actually kind of weird because the hair used to be blonde, and then I realized that he started to look like Morty from Rick and Morty. So I changed the hair to brown, and then I changed the pants color to blue. And so now all his features are much more distinguishable. Rendering all the different parts of the character is kind of difficult because in Blender they give me this list of materials, but I need to set most of these materials to one that I've called invisible, which basically stops them from being rendered. So you can see here that they're just not there anymore. And so by using the invisible texture, I can choose specific things that I want to render. The problem is that once they're all called invisible, I can't actually tell what is what anymore. So what I did was I wrote this little add-on for Blender, just for this file, where I can click these buttons down here under Material Presets. So, watch this. Solo Head. Right? So that basically turns off everything but the head. And then I can solo the arms, the sleeves, the torso. Right? And so if I want to render the legs and the torso, I can click those buttons and the head. And so if I click all of them, then he'll be back to where he was. And then there are some specific requirements, such as if I'm trying to render the legs, sometimes I need to mask half of it away and then add this circle on top of it to smooth it out. This thing has hugely improved the workflow and I'm not so afraid to actually change the model anymore because it makes it so easy to actually re-render the specific things that I want to without breaking everything. I also made some new art. If I open up boat.blend here, you can see I've made a boat. If you look at it from above, that's what it's supposed to look like. It doesn't really have to look that good from below. As you can see, it's a total mess from below, but you only have to look at it from above and it looks perfect. Also, if you look at this tiled wall here, you can see it's just one row of tiles. And when you look at it from above, it looks pretty good. I actually got my wife and my friend to separately play the game as it is right now. That revealed a lot of problems, as you might guess, because basically nobody but me has played it, so I just sort of expect it to work one way, and then when someone else comes along, they just, they're just using it wrong, you know? So I took note of everything they were having problems with, and I made a bunch of fixes, such as making just about everything heavier to interact with. Things were just moving way too fast, like faster than physically possible if you just click and then drag really really fast. And there were some issues with interaction where if you click and then hold for five seconds and then move over a door it'll start interacting with the door. 
which results in some confusing things. So basically, that was pretty helpful. I recommend if you're making a game that you definitely just get anyone to test it, because they'll reveal a whole bunch of stuff that you should probably fix before it becomes a huge problem. I decided it was about time to plan out a lot of the game's gameplay. So I came up with this sort of systematic way to do it, where I write exactly what events take place in the game. I say, like, the player interacts with this thing, and then they do this thing, and then this thing happens. I say step by step exactly what I want to happen in the game. And then as I implement each thing, I can just tick it off, and then it's done. Since this is a story-based game, and you sort of have to do everything in order, I figured out that those tasks that I'm writing in my story could actually be used to drive the story in the game itself. I'm not going to show you the actual story, so I'll just type up an example. Basic... Crips. <laughs> Crisps. That's British. Chips. Ugh. Okay, so here's the little example that I've come up with. The player gets hungry for chips. And then the player goes to get the chips, and then he eats the chips. And then the door opens as soon as the chips have been eaten. And then you go to the front door. So basically my job is to implement all this stuff. Basically the idea is that at some point the player is hungry for chips. So this task here gets ticked in the to-do list. And that's when dialogue appears or something that like informs the player that they are actually hungry for chips. And then the player will go to get some chips and then eat the chips. And then the actual action of eating the chips is what checks this task. So basically each task is checked by the event that comes just before it. There will be a central story manager system and then the front door itself will actually open because the story manager system told the door that the door opens task was checked. So this story manager, I'm actually going to generate it with a Python script. So my script will go through and parse whatever's in square brackets here and here and then turn it into a giant enum in C sharp and then things can just listen to entries of that enum. They'll subscribe to particular events in the story, and then the story itself will actually enforce that order of events. So as I edit my story file, the game will be synchronized with that file. I hope that explanation was clear enough, because I'm moving on to a different topic now. So C Sharp has this type called nullable that allows any struct to have a null value, which is usually not possible. So if you just have int i equals null, that's not actually possible because int can't be assigned to null. But if you add a question mark after it, it makes it nullable, allowing it to have this extra value null. The problem here is that Unity can't serialize nullable values, which is really annoying because it's a really common use case. So I started using Unity 2020 and I noticed that it can serialize generic structs, which is something that it couldn't do before. So I use this capability of the new Unity to create a type that looks almost exactly like the nullable type from the C-sharp standard library called option, but the difference is that it's actually serializable. It's really simple to use. All you do is you wrap a type in option and you're good to go. And so this is what that looks like in Unity. It adds this extra checkbox. You can uncheck it. It adds this dash 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 to let you know that it's null currently. And then you can check it and then it gives you the editor for those values. It seems like such a simple thing, but it makes using Unity so much nicer. I started doing this Twitter thing like four weeks ago, and I've gained a pretty decent number of followers. So if you're interested, you can follow me there, and there'll be all sorts of little small videos that I make after I implement each thing. For example, this update right here, where I made the rope system have pretty visuals on it instead of just looking like a bunch of red lines everywhere. Please tell me what you think about this less scripted format. It's hopefully much easier for me to do, and it means I can spend more time actually making a game. And of course, please like and subscribe if you want to see more.